Oh, we look to the sun. Good morning, everybody. Good to see everybody. Why don't you uh, take a second, say hi to the person next to you. Give them a big smile. Good to be here, isn't it? Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior, see the image of love, sing His praises forever. Oh, we look to the sun. We look to the Lord. Oh, we look to the Salvation, salvation, tearing through the dead of night. See the kingdom burst into color at the speed of light. Freedom, freedom, shaking up the atmosphere. As the shadows fade into nothing as the day appears Beyond the skies above Love reaching out for us The everlasting one Jesus our God Oh, we look to the sun Forever, oh, we look 
There's a grace when the heart is on the fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the waters Holding back the seas I should ever need reminder Of how I've been set free There is a cross that bears the burden There is another in the fire All my dad left were dead beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore Should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I won't bow to the things of this world. Nothing stands 
Thank you, Lord. God, we thank you for today. All we are is yours, Lord. Lord, in our weakness, you are strong. When we're in need, you are there. And today we, uh, we just give you our lives, Lord. We give you our passions, our desires, our futures. We worship you today, Lord. Let's just worship God for a second. Just lift up your voices. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we thank you for salvation. Thank you that you're not done working on us. Lord, you are good. Thank you that you never let us down, that you're always there. Pray that you be with us the rest of today, Father, that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Max, and welcome to Life Church. If you like to worship this morning, then join us next Sunday at 6.30 p.m. for Awaken. We will be hosting an additional gathering that includes one hour of prayer and worship. Let's come together, lay aside our distractions, and lift our hearts to God. Hey guys, Alexa here to quickly tell you that right after Awaken next week, we'll be hosting a farewell party for the Quorum family. As many of you know, Max and Erica Quorum and their boys have accepted a position in Oklahoma City with the Version Bible app and will be relocating to Oklahoma in February. So join us for dessert, thanking God for the Quorums, celebrating this new season, and praying over them. Okay, now back to the announcements. And men, the No Regrets Conference is going down this Saturday on February 5th. Make sure to secure your tickets before the event starts. Purchasing options as well as all of the information about the event is available on our website. We will meet here in the church parking lot at 610 a.m. to carpool. This Wednesday night is family night. Join us at 6.30 p.m. in the cafe for our discipleship track or the regular adult elective. There are classes and programming for all ages every single week. So make sure to bring your kiddos and their friends and even a neighbor as well. If this is your first time visiting with us, we would love to connect with you. Please fill out one of the blue connect cards on a seat near you. After the gathering, make sure to drop it off at Guest Central on your way out to receive a welcome bag and ask any questions you may have about the church. At Life Church, you have two ways to give financially. Simply drop your offering envelope into one of the giving boxes on your way out, or you can give securely on our website. That's all I have for you today. If you are needing another environment to watch the service, feel free to check out the cafe or one of their mom's rooms. Thank you so much for being here, Life Church. I appreciate you, I love you, and enjoy the gathering. That's right. That's right. Where's Max? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right, Max. Yeah, it's, uh, it's true. Hey, everybody. Great to see you, those watching online, streaming this morning. Thanks for taking time to do that. We want to give you an opportunity at the Life Church webpage or Life Church Facebook page to pull up your notes. Um, because it's always fun to fill in blanks together, right? It's more fun doing it together. And, um, and so, yeah, those of you in the auditorium, we know you're already you're set to go, you're ready. Pin in hand, and that's good, that's good. Hey guys, just an affirmation of what Max said about the No Regrets Conference next Saturday. Um, really encourage you to get a ticket, and uh, we have a great time every time we head out to uh, the conference. So it's good to be together as men, and um, 
some great teaching, and we get to apply that into our lives. So, yeah, just a heads up on that as well. When uh, Diana Nyad was nine years old, she was standing on a beach in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, just looking out over the ocean. And uh, her mom was standing nearby, and so she looked to her mom and said, Hey, Mom, where's Cuba? (laughs) And it kind of caught her mom off guard. So uh, she said, It's right over there. It's right over there. Um, You can't see it, but um, it's so close you can almost swim there. Well, for some reason, that resonated within Diana. Um, 20 years later, she would attempt to swim from Cuba to Florida. She swam 78 miles in 42 hours, but strong winds stopped her progress and she fell short of her goal. The dream of becoming the first person to swim across the Straits of Florida would then lie dormant within her for the next three decades. When Diana turned 60, she figured it was either now or never. Right? It's now or never. Um, Her second attempt was cut short by an asthma attack. Her third attempt failed because she was stung by a Portuguese man of of war. Not just one sting, but a second sting as well. For those of you that uh, never have been stung by a man of war, um, that's the way God made them to sting their victims. They, uh, they paralyze small fish with their stingers and have them for lunch. For human beings, it's not so bad. It can be a mild or moderate sting. In rare cases, it's life-threatening. But it will leave a, a nice welt on, you, on your body. Her fourth attempt ended up <laughs> with... Nine jellyfish stings. Uh, and you'd start to think after a while, what's next, you know? I mean, uh, <laughs> what else could get me out of here? And so you'd say, is that the end of the story? And the answer is no. No, it's not the end of the story. Because on the morning of August 31st, 2013, uh, 64-year-old Diana and I had would start one last attempt. 54 hours later... Nyad swam ashore on Key West. Her tongue was swollen because of the salt water, but her message was loud and clear. This is what she said. We should never, ever give up. You are never too old to chase your dream. And the question is, how did Diana Nyad endure the physical pain, the mental agony of swimming 110 miles especially when the so-called experts said it was humanly impossible to do. Why did she refuse to give up, even after four failed attempts? Well, you'd have to say it would be grit. Um, Diana saw herself as a champion swimmer, and she never gave up. Likewise, the Apostle Paul, in whom we'll be taking a look at his letter, He saw himself as a child of God, as a man of God. That's how he saw himself. That was his identity. In fact, when you jump into the Pauline epistles or the letters that Paul wrote, the phrase in Christ is included 164 times. So Paul had a grip. He had an understanding of what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ and have in Christ, in Christ, we are in Christ. That's our identity. And it's the key that unlocks our destiny. And so this morning, just a, a flare in the air, you're not a, defined by the things that you've done wrong in your past. Instead, you're defined by what Christ did. It's his righteousness. His righteousness. And to think that just like in the beginning when God created Adam and Eve, he is still creating human beings to be in his image, in his likeness. In Genesis 1.27 on the screen, God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. 
he created them. That's still happening today, by the way. Just pause if you're having a rough day, a rough week, a rough month, if you're having a rough year already. I think it's good to pause and just reflect on the fact that you were knitted together by the hands of God, the hands of God. He put you together. And you're not a mistake. You're here, right here, right now, on purpose. Because God has a great plan for you. In Philippians 2.13, we've hit this a few times, but I tell you, man, uh, I, I am thoroughly enjoying this letter to the Philippians, and we just go back to, for God is working in you. Why are we fired up this morning? Yeah. Friends, we are not in a funeral service. We are in a celebration of the fact that Jesus Christ went to the cross. He paid your sin, my sin debt in full. He was my substitute, your substitute. And the grave couldn't hold him. Boom, he came out of there three days later. And you know what he's doing? Just like Paul said, he's working in us. He's working in you. He loves to work in us. That's what gets him fired up. And here's the interesting thing. When God, who created you and I, he gives you and I the permission to say no to him. We can say, no, God, I don't want you to work in my life anymore. I'm good. I can do this on my own. Man, oh, man, what we miss out on when we have that kind of an attitude. But God's working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Oh, man, that's what happens when a people come together on a Sunday and throughout the week to realize that God is working in each one of us. That's how we get fired up. God's working in us. He's giving us the desire and the power to do what's pleasing to the Lord. And to think that the word working in the Greek, to put into operation, to be active, to come into activity, to be an active power. God is placing that active power in you and me so that we can live for Jesus Christ and reflect his character. Let's go to the book of Philippians 3, and I, I get it, we've been here before. <clears throat> I was reading over Philippians 3 last night again, and just reading slowly, and just thinking about what a great text it is. And Paul writes, I want to know Christ, verse 10. Let's stop and think about that. I want to know Christ. We, the hu created humans in the image of God, God has given us the freedom to say, no, I don't want to know Christ. And so right off the bat, we can say, Lord, I want to know Christ. I do. I want, I want to know you. I don't, know what, I don't want to know about you. I want to know you intimately. And experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. Listen, if you think you have to be perfect to be in this place or watch online, that is not true at all, friends. We are not going to be perfect until we get to heaven. But in the meantime, in the meantime, <laughs> yes, in the meantime, God is working in us, see? Because if we were perfect, he wouldn't have to work in us, right? That's right. That's right. So, Paul says, I press on to possess the perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear friends, brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, 
Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. You see, Jesus is calling you to, and he's calling me to finish the race. Not just to finish, but to finish strong. And so, Lord, we thank you this morning. What, what an amazing thing to reflect on the fact that we get to know you. You, you make yourself known to those who want to know you. And this morning, Lord, we come together and say to you, we want to know you, Lord. We want to know more about you. We want you more involved in our lives. We want to reflect you more to those around us. And so today, we recognize and fully understand that every single person in this room and watching online are probably at a different place spiritually. Some are asking questions. Some are searching. They don't know you, but they, they have questions about you, God. There's some that may be here that don't want to be here. And there's others that are here out of habit. It's a ritual. And there's others that are here because they want to be here. And so wherever we fall in, Lord, we know that you are coming after us. <laughs> Man, you're coming after us because of your great love. And we sang about it, to surrender, Lord. We surrender to you. Everything we have, Lord, we surrender to you. How liberating that is. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, you realize this is January 30th? Did you think about that? What does that mean? That means we're almost out of January. Now, now before you clap, <laughs> uh, this is what I've been thinking about, that, that <clears throat> yeah, time, time goes, but it's so easy. I, I, I kind of sense this even last week where we're moving so quickly through time that, you know, on the beginning, the first week or two, you know, the, the drive, you know, it's a new year, it's a new beginning. Um, the Lord is challenging us, but now we're, we're at the tail end of a month already, the first month of a brand new year, and we're already we're, we're dipping in as veterans, Right? We've been in this year for almost a whole month, so let's get on with it. But here's the thing, man. It's so easy to lose perspective that, yes, we are on the front end. And so we're going to drill down this morning and challenge all of us, myself. To know the Lord. To give him freedom. To move. We can't afford to keep, you know, let's just keep rolling without dealing with what's going on in the inside. And I want to challenge you today, man. What have you brought into 2022 from 2021 that needed to go and you still have it? Huh? What is it? Put a name on it. Identify it. What is that one thing that's slowing you down spiritually? That one habit, that one addiction that keeps dragging you into the pit, into the weeds, man. It's time, I'm telling you, man, it, it is time to let it go, to put it on the table and say, Lord, I need your help, you know, I'm going to surrender it to you. And so, um, I wouldn't be able to read this next week because it's February, so I need to read it today. Uh, J. Lee Grady, he's a Christian author, speaker. He writes, don't let this cold world put out your spiritual fire. Right? He said, I'm not a cold weather guy, so I, I didn't enjoy the snow we got this past Sunday in Georgia. So you know where Grady lives. He lives in Georgia. Uh, whenever cold weather hits hard, I think about 
A verse in Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 12, verse 11, he told his followers that in order to please God, they needed to be, to, to serve the Lord enthusiastically. To serve the Lord enthusiastically or to serve the Lord with a zealous spirit or let the spirit excite you as you serve the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, when you get into the Greek, and I know that's okay, uh, we're not going to get too deep into the Greek, but the word enthusiastically means to boil with heat, to be hot, to be zealous. We have a responsibility to stay hot for God no matter how cold our spiritual environment is. Friends, we are in 2022 already. Almost getting ready to say goodbye to January. We need to stay hot. No matter how cold our spiritual environment is. So he asked, how do you stay hot for the Lord? How do you raise your spiritual temperature at a time when many people's faith has gone from lukewarm to freezing? And here are some steps you can take to reach the boiling point. Number one, get back in the Word. In other words, read the Bible. Spiritual zeal is kindled in your heart when you hear God speak through His Word. Two, stoke the furnace of private prayer. Fires don't last long if you don't regularly pile wood on the flames. You should guard your quiet time with God as if your life depended on it. Is your life depending on that? You cannot survive spiritually without regular communion with the Lord. Oswald Chambers put it bluntly, prayer is the vital breath of the Christian, not the thing that makes him alive, but the evidence that he is alive. Praise God with abandon number three, like we did this morning. Come on. Yo! Huh? Yeah, man. So... So I heard a song on the radio Friday, first time I heard it, and I mentally put it in my head to look it up on YouTube when I got back home. And man, I was playing that song yesterday, you know? And it was talked about God being so good. It's a new song, man. It's good. God is so good. But it's a great song. And just playing that over and over again and worshiping the Lord. You know, all by yourself. But we know God is there. We know his angels are hanging around for fun. Right? So we praise God with abandon. Sometimes discouragement, fear, anxiety can form icicles in our souls. Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. The only way to melt them is to rejoice in the Lord. Can, can I tell you how much I was looking forward to this morning to being with you? Because hmm? that gets me fired up too, you know? To be able to sing to the Lord together as a family. So if you're going through an extended period of heaviness or disappointment, when you praise God with exuberance, new strength will arise. Make a decision that you will praise God in, more, in a more vocal, uninhibited way this year than ever before. If you need help praising God, put on your favorite praise music and turn up the volume. Crank it, baby! Right? I'll take you back in history. When our kids were young, and we are going through a real... Spiritual battle, man. It was dark. And we had a CD. That's when we had CDs and CD players. Remember those? <laughs> Little records or whatever you want to call them. Man, we, we, we put that on our CD play. All the kids, man, we had them all in the kitchen. And, and we cranked up the worship music. And it was, a, it was a, like a marching worshiping, upbeat song, man. And we would just march around our house, worshiping the Lord. And it was a heavy time. Do you let the heavy times bury you? No. You have to respond. I'm not going to allow this circumstance to destroy my relationship with God, to rob my joy. 
And so, so we praise God. Break free from bad habits. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, don't quench the spirit. Are you doing anything that's extinguishing the spirit's flames in your life? That's a good question. What is it? Many Christians remain perpetually immature, unable to grow spiritually because they won't let go of lustful thoughts, habits, or harmful addictions. It's got a grip on you. And so if you choose to live in bondage, you'll never be hot for God. Isn't that, it's kind of a pity. People choose that. Next, get rid of resentments. Jesus said in the last days, most people's love will grow cold, Matthew 24, 12. Don't be part of the cooling trend. Nothing puts out the flame of God's love faster than bitterness, friend. Don't allow unforgiveness to freeze your soul. Guard your heart and deal with offensive quickly. So one of of my daily, one of the things I pray for daily is for God to protect the unity at Life Church. It's a gift. And as human beings, it's so easy to become offended or harbor unforgiveness or bitterness, and that will throw cold water on you spiritually. Not only that, but it can impact those around you in your circle of influence. And so you and I both have a responsibility, first of all, to say, Lord, I choose not to be offended. Because that's a a character of what Jesus was never offended. You know? He let things go. He forgave. He didn't hang on to bitterness. When he was, I went through the crucifixion the other day, and, and the Pharisees and the crowd, when you read that, you can feel the weight of the hatred and the anger of these people. Crucify him. And he was tortured. And as he's on the cross, and the two criminals on his right and left are mocking him, what does Jesus say? Father, forgive them. And so I want to encourage you and I want to encourage myself to forgive freely. Really, let it go. Don't let offense destroy your relationship with the Lord. And um, another one, get in close fellowship. Fires go out when the embers are far apart. But when you pull the coals closer together, the flames return. This is why we should never live the Christian life in seclusion. Yeah? Come on, talk to me. Right? Yeah, man. That's that's a thumbs up. We We don't live it in seclusion. God called us to be in community. We make sure that you're in a church that's on fire for God. Another one, start using your spiritual gifts. Real spiritual passion is ignited when you serve others. Every Christian has a spiritual gift, and you're no exception. And finally, share your faith. There's nothing more exciting than leading a person to faith in Christ. Statistics show that 95% of Christians have never led one person to salvation. I guarantee if you share the gospel with a neighbor, co-worker, server at a restaurant, a stranger, your spiritual temperature will instantly rise 30 degrees. And you will want to share with someone else. In this new year, I encourage you to stoke your flame and let it blaze before those around you. This cold, dark world needs enthusiastic Christians who have reached the boiling point of spiritual passion. Yeah. So, 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 so what? Hebrews 12, 12, 13. So here's a challenge for all of us before we 
leave January this year. So take a new grip with your tired hands. Are you tired? Hmm. I was thinking about um, Diana Nayed, who, who dealt with asthma attacks, who dealt with strong winds, with the uh, Portuguese um, man of war, the jellyfish things. Uh, maybe you are dealing with strong winds in your life. Maybe you're dealing with asthma attacks. Not literally, but there are attacks. Maybe the Portuguese men of war in the world have come after you and you feel like you're under attack. Or maybe, maybe the jellyfish have been coming after you and you can put a name on it, a face on it, whatever the case may be. And it's discouraged you to give up to not press on in your relationship with the Lord. Just like Diana and I had said, never, never give up. And Paul would echo that this morning. No matter what you're going through, God knows what you're going through. He knows exactly what you're going through, and he's not leaving you alone. He's walking you through it. And so... So get a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. Let's do that together, friends. Let's get a new grip. Let's strengthen our weak knees. We just heard of ways of doing that. And uh, man, let's, let's get on with it because I'm telling you, these are very critical days. I don't have to tell you about that. You know, a lot of, we live in a changing world, a rapidly changing world, which leads me to Daryl Strawberry. (laughs) Daryl! Oh! Well, well, a little foggy there, but here's Daryl here on the cover of his book. Daryl was a, uh, professional baseball player uh, for the New York Mets. I'm going to give you a little history again in our family. We were going on to visit my grandma down in Arkansas. And we, on the way back, we stopped in St. Louis to watch the St. Louis uh, team play the New York Mets. And it happened that Daryl Strawberry was on the Mets at that time. And I leaned over to my boys and said, he's going to hit a home run. He was up coming up the bat, and sure enough, boom, he hit a home run. The dude was messed up, though. When you read his book, he was a drug addict. He, he, his, he had an abusive father. He had anger issues, man, and the list goes on and on and on. He, the dude was messed up big time. And, and listen to what he says. This is for all of us, that because the tomb could not hold Jesus, and for those of us who receive God's gift of forgiveness, our sins will not be held against us. Woo! Man! They're not going to be held against us. We're free! When I accepted God's gift of grace and Jesus' salvation from my sins, I received new life in Jesus Christ. I am born again. Now check this out. My identity has been redefined. I no longer see myself, my circumstances, or others in the same way. My mind has been renewed. I think differently and talk differently. The shame, the guilt, the insecurities that overshadowed me my entire life have been overcome by God's glorious light. Is Daryl fired up? Man, he's fired up. My scars and pain have been have a purpose. I now can forgive myself and others. I seek to serve others instead of desiring to be served. No longer am I a slave to sin. I am God's choice servant. No longer am I God's enemy. I am his ambassador of reconciliation. I don't hunger and thirst anymore to be whole and complete. Instead of running from God, I run to him every day in prayer. And now my running doesn't exhaust me. I don't grow weary and tired as I run God's race. My weakness is now a platform to display God's strength. 
He is the breath in my lungs, the love in my heart, and the purpose in my steps. As I daily read and meditate on God's word, I learn how to love God more with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. All that to say, I've been changed. But this makeover will not fade away. The transformation is eternal, and yes, I'm still a work in progress. Jesus continues to refine me and remake me more in his likeness, pruning away the parts in my life that don't point others to him. And as I mature in my relationship with Jesus, I continue to learn and discover that the more I'm willing to let go of control of my life, the more he replaces my old tired ways with his new and improved way of living, a Christ-centered life. Kind of sounds like Paul, doesn't it? When I read that, I thought, man, the dude must have been reading Philippians. Huh? Yeah. So, Daryl Strawberry... Echoes Paul, I haven't arrived, but God's working in me. He's changing me, and that gets me fired up. And so, friends, as we move to a brand new month in a couple days, let's keep the fire burning. Let's stay hot for God. And listen, I, I get it. I, I understand life. Amen. It can beat you up and you're hanging by a thread. I understand that. But stay with the, the core values and habits of meeting with the Lord daily. And he's faithful. He's faithful. So, in your notes... Um, Real quick, I want to know Christ, Paul says. I want to know him. And once again, Paul has been following Christ for 30 years. And he's not content. He's not, you know, he's not satisfied. You know, I've been through so much. I know God's done with me. No, that's not what Paul says. I want, I haven't achieved anything, man. But I want to know Christ more. That's his heart. May that bleed into our hearts this morning, that same passion. Number two, I haven't arrived yet. Verse 12a, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. There, there's a dissatisfaction in Paul. You, you caught that in Daryl Strawberry's talk right there as well. There was, a dissat- there was excitement that God was working in him, but there was a, a dissatisfaction to keep moving and growing in that relationship with the Lord. And, and a follower of Christ, man, one, one of the attributes that we should have is that we never allow ourselves to become satisfied in our spiritual accomplishments, yeah. right? We should never let that happen. And Paul says, man, I'm, I'm not there, but I, I want to keep on moving. Number three, I want to grow more. I want to grow more. Verse 12b, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. So Paul saw the Christian life um, as a process. Um, That word perfection means complete, finished project. So Paul is saying, I'm not there yet, and none of us will be there yet for perfection, but we we, we will be complete And we will be a finished project when Jesus comes for us. Um, What's cool, Paul says he hasn't arrived. There's, There's progress. That's his desire. Progress is the main agenda in his life. He's progressing in his relationship with the Lord. And if you can see changes in your own personal life, let's say from a year ago, you can take heart. You know, you're on the right road. And it reminds me, last Sunday after church, a dude uh, came up to me and he, he said, man, God, God has been working in my life. And he talked about um, about his wife. And he asked for forgiveness. And he said, I, I, didn't, I didn't used to do that, but God's working in me. And I can tell you, man, my heart just 
smile. Because that's, that's all, that should be all of us, man, that we are, God is working in us. He's changing us. We're progressing. We're growing more, more like him. And so Paul says, I'm, uh, I'm, I press on to possess that for what Christ gave to me. Now, um, that word possess, it means to apprehend, to see something after a pursuit. And in the original, it's showing a present tense where it's ongoing. It doesn't happen like once a week or you do it once and you're done. No, it's describing an ongoing, it's a, a grasping, it's a strenuous pursuit going after God. And Paul, and he seems to land here a lot using um, the language of war or athletics. Um, and so that kind of leans me into um, the motto of the French Foreign Legion. This is their motto. It's not in the Bible. Okay? If I falter, push me on. If I stumble, pick me up. If I retreat, shoot me. <laughs> You'd say, that's pretty strong talk. <laughs> it is. It is. Hopefully, hopefully we have friends around us that if we're retreating spiritually, they don't shoot us, literally. They shoot us with a gospel gun, you know. They come in love and say, hey, hey, don't, don't retreat anymore. Let's, let's turn this thing around. Martin Luther put it this way, the Bible is alive, it speaks to me, it has feet, it runs after me, it has hands, it lays hold of me. Yeah, yeah. So spiritual growth, we know, doesn't just happen, right? You've noticed that. Uh, it would be cool. I, I was thinking about this last week already. Um, the snow, the layer of snow over my lawn, uh, I can't see the weeds, but under that snow in the ground, there are weeds. They're talking to each other. <laughs> you guys ready? We're going we're gonna to jump out of the ground here in about six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the weeds, man. I, you know, you don't see them, but they're already talking to each other. They're ready to roll. And so, so I'm thinking, man, I got to get my weed killer out. Here I am in January. I'm thinking about weed. What's the matter with you, man? I don't know. I don't know. Just, I'm messed up. But um, the same thing with spiritual growth. How about it? We know, we know that we are in a war. We're in a battle. And we have an enemy that wants to take us out. And we're not paranoid about that. We're just simply aware of it, and we live our lives accordingly. So, uh, Cooper Cup, you'll see him in the game today. Who is Cooper Cup? He is a uh, wide receiver for the L.A. Rams. Whew, what a game last week. Let's not get into that. but um, Cooper Cup... The dude comes from a Christian family, and he attributes his success uh, in the NFL by his father spending time with him as a kid, like throwing passes to him, like he would set up a hose in the yard so to make catches, keeping your toes inside the hose, see, stuff like that. Um, but anyway... Um, he was asked, football's a game about speed and how do you prepare yourself for what's required. He says, you come into work and you've got to be laser focused all the way through. This is Cooper talking. And, um, and so they asked him about his college football days. How did that prepare you for the NFL? He said, I had coaches that came around me that never let me become complacent with anything. Yes, this is good, but this is how you can get better. It was just calling me to something greater than what I'm seeing for myself. Look at how much better you can be if you fix these things. That's what they would say. And get in there and say, well, this is good. How can I become better? Okay. 
And in his post-game press conference, he referenced Proverbs 16, 9. The heart of a man chooses his path, but the Lord establishes his steps. And Coop Cup says, it just gave me so much freedom to go out there and play free, give everything I had, knowing the results rested with the Lord. My faith in God and his plan for me allows me to play freely without doubt or fear. And um, Cooper Cup, man, um, he says you've got to be laser focused. You've got to have people around you that challenge you to keep growing, to improve. And I thought, man, that's, that's how it is in a Christian faith as well. You know, having people around us, come on, come on, let's grow, let's grow. Let's encourage each other. So... Uh, we've talked about this Psalm 37, 34, put your hope in the Lord and travel steadily along his path. And the question is, from two weeks ago, are you a turtle or are you a rabbit? <laughs> Remember the, the race, the race, you know? And of course, everybody would think the rabbit would win. And And I think two weeks ago we started a, Turtle Club, right? I haven't seen any applications for that yet, but um, anyway, uh, steady, staying steady, one day at a time. I'm I'm growing in my walk. I, I don't not speeding up and then taking a break from God, speeding up, taking a break. No, I'm steady every single day. So, turtle or rabbit? Turtle. turtle. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Paul says, I press on. One of the great theologians um, in Christian history was Augustine, lived in the 300s AD, and he was saved out of, out of a very immoral lifestyle. And before his conversion, he had a mistress named Claudia, and shortly after Augustine put his faith in Christ, um, Claudia saw Augustine walking down the street, and she said, Augustine! Augustine! And he paid no attention to her. He just kept walking. Augustine! Augustine! She cried out again, it's Claudia! Mm. And finally, Augustine responded, but it's no longer Augustine. As he continued on his way, and for the rest of his life. And so with Daryl Strawberry and with Augustine... When you put your faith in Christ, you keep growing more like Christ. And when temptations come our way, we say no to those. Because why? We realize how much God loves us. And I don't want to make a decision that will hurt the Father God who loves me so much. Right? That's right. And so I choose to say no to temptation or sin. And say yes to following after Jesus Christ. Number four, I focus on one thing, verse 13. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. The message puts it this way, but I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back. That's good, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And let's focus on one thing. Paul says, I focus on this one thing. So Sabine Moreau, she was 67 years old from Belgium. She learned the hard way after following faulty GPS directions. She was supposed to go just 90 miles from her hometown in Belgium to pick up a friend at the Brussels train station. That's 90 miles. Or GPS sent her 900 miles south. Not 90 miles to the train station, but 900 miles south. And she said, during the second day of driving, I realized something wasn't right. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, you see, that's off to grandmother's house we go, right? Uh, 
And so she said, <laughs> she stopped for gas twice, she slept on the side of the road, and she even was in a minor auto accident. And she told the newspaper reporters, because they, they heard about it and they tracked her down. She said, I was distracted. So I kept driving. I saw all kinds of traffic signs, first in French, then in German, and finally in Croatian. But I kept driving because I was distracted. Suddenly, I appeared in Zagreb, and I realized I wasn't in Belgium anymore. <laughs> What's the point? What's the point? What's distracting you? What is distracting you? What's distracting me and my... What's preventing me from growing spiritually? What's preventing you from growing spiritually? Okay. We need to find out what those distractions are and, and deal with them. You know, and crossing those, that finish line, it's keeping that string on that finish line you know, in front of us. Yeah. I'm out in front of that. David Livingston, you know, he was a great missionary doctor in Africa in the 1800s, and he returned to uh, Great Britain for some rest, and they, he was asked, where do you want to go now? And his answer was, I'm ready to go anywhere, provided it be forward. Yeah, forward. You know, today in our culture, distractions are very common. Very common. The internet, um, social media, um, global tech said that the average person checks their smartphones 96 times a day. That's a distraction. What's distracting you? What's distracting me? What's keeping me from going after God? Well, Paul says this one thing, and it's not going to distract me. He says, I'm forgetting the past. Verse 13b, forgetting the past. When you look at Paul's life and, and the, the place he came out of, Man, he could have been paralyzed. You know, once he, <laughs> he got knocked off his horse on the road to Damascus, you know, and he put his faith in Christ, he said, man, I did that, but phew, I know God can't use me. You know, I used to persecute Christians. I used to arrest Christians. I would have Christians tortured for their faith. And yet Paul made a decision. And his decision was, I am not going to allow my past to paralyze me for today or my future. And this morning, what's paralyzing you from your past? Because that can hold you back. That can be that stingray in the ocean biting at you to remind you of your past. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.15, this is a trustworthy saying and everybody should accept that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and I am the worst of them all. See, that's how he saw himself, man. I, I, was, I was a sinner, man, but Jesus saved me. And forgetting the past doesn't mean you fail to remember. <laughs> you know, you fail to remember. Uh, you know, you, I'm going to put that out of my head. No. Forgetting the past means no longer to be influenced by or affected by. See? We, we can't forget, like, we blow it out of our brains our past will be there, but we choose to no longer be influenced by it or affected by it. Why? Because we've been forgiven by Jesus Christ. Because he doesn't see it, because we've confessed that to him. He sees the righteousness of Christ in us. And so, how good is that, that Paul says, There is now no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus in Romans 8.1. There is no condemnation. Some of you may have heard the story of David Berkowitz. In the summer of 1976, he terrorized the city of New York. 
He was nicknamed the son of Sam, went on a killing spree, killing six, wounding seven over that summer. Berkowitz was dubbed the son of Sam because after a note he left at a crime scene, he said, I am a monster. I am the son of Sam. And David was involved in the occult. And after intense manhunts and widespread public panic throughout New York, he was finally arrested the following year. He was given six life sentences, 365 consecutive years in prison. But here's the thing. After 10 years in prison, somebody gave him a Gideon's New Testament with the book of Psalms on the tail end of it. What does he do? He opens up Psalm 34. I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation, I prayed, and the Lord listened, and he saved me from all my troubles. Do you realize that David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, felt the presence of God, the love of God, in that prison cell? After reading that, he got down on his knees, and he placed his trust in Jesus Christ. And he allowed Jesus to forgive him. In a two-page letter, Berkowitz said he had no interest in parole thanks to the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. He's 68 years old now, and he said, I have no interest in parole and no plans to seek release. If you could understand this, I am already a free man. I am not saying this jokingly. I really am. Jesus Christ has already forgiven and pardoned me, and I believe this. What's holding you back, friend? You can't forgive yourself. You've been living in shame. You know, God forgives everybody else, but he can't forgive you. David Berkowitz believed what God says. What believe, he believes what was in the Bible. And he says yes to that. And this morning, as we look at Paul in prison under house arrest, he had experienced the forgiveness of God. He forgave himself for all he did against the church of Jesus Christ, which liberated him to become the man that God wanted him to be. That's what God wants for you and me this morning. Friend, you... If you have not placed your faith in Christ, first of all, we have to acknowledge the fact that I'm a sinner, you know? Sin will keep me away from a holy God. And Jesus died and he rose again. And when you place your trust in him and him alone, like in Romans 5, 8, that Christ died for us. He died for us. He died in our place. He was our substitute. It would be like a house is on fire. The firemen come. They go into the house. They rescue the the owners of the home. But one of the firemen can't get out, and he dies inside a burning home. He took your place. Jesus took your place. He took my place. The greatest substitute of all. And you're saved by putting your trust in Jesus, not in, not in a prayer. You simply say, Jesus, I trust you this morning with all of my weight that you are who you said you are, the Savior of the world. Like David Berkowitz, who could forgive himself after being forgiven by God. So God wants to do that for you this morning, to forgive you to begin a relationship with you because he loves you so much. And so, Father, we thank you this morning for the great love that you have. We thank you, Lord, that 
you've given us evidence of your faithfulness, your goodness. And today I pray for every person online and every person in this room that if they have not ever put their trust in you this morning, they would say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. You went to the cross. You paid for my sin debt. You were my substitute. And you came out of that grave three days later. And because of that, Jesus, I'm putting my trust in you today. All of my trust. I do believe you are the Savior of the world. So thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for becoming my spiritual leader as I follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. And Lord, as we all pause and reflect upon our lives, what's, what's holding us back? What's slowing us down spiritually? We identify that one thing right now, Lord. And we put it on the table where you're sitting across from us. And saying, Lord, I'm letting this go through the power of your spirit. Help me to live for you, Lord. Help me to pursue you. Help me to know you more. As we run together this race in 2022. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in When I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire was another in the water, holding back the sea. Should I ever be reminded how I would set free? There is a cross that bears the burden, another died for me. There is another in the fire. slave to my sin anymore and should I fall in the space between you know what remains of me and this reckoning either way I will bow to the things of this world then I know
We're going to keep playing. If you need to uh, take off, have a great rest of the day. 